And if you'd like to watch this for playback or share it with a friend, feel free to do so. Today, we are hosting Dan Roth. Um, Dan wrote this tiny little intro about himself, and I could just go on and on and spend the entire <laughs> hour talking about how wonderful Dan is. So definitely pay attention, take notes, and just listen. I mean, if you are eating and you, you, you're you splitting your time, please do so and listen up because Dan is uh, somebody to be reckoned with, absolutely. Dan is a graduate of Mammoth University. Um, one of our local colleges, right? And um, he has moved to California. And so he's giving us time today to help other businesses in this area to grow, to flourish, to find out what's going on um, from the recruiter side. Dan has been a job seeker as well as a recruiter. And everyone talks about Amazon because they're just blossoming in this area, right? And so he's going to talk a little bit about that and how you can take advantage of this great recession, great resignation, great whatever you want to call it, to get people in the door working. Okay, so um, definitely pay attention. And Dan, take it away. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Christine. So hey, everyone. Uh, you know, Christine did a great job with doing the intro. So first and foremost, I always like to start off any engagement that I do by saying, hi, my name is Dan, I'm neurodiverse. So I'm ADHD. The reason I say that is because uh, I am a recruiter that focuses in on uh, equal rights and because I have it, it's a, it's a standing point. Yeah, I also wanna say that when, without getting into too much of my history, when I left Monmouth and I'm gonna date myself back in 2007, I had actually, failed out my freshman year, barely got back in, and then it really had to fight to, to graduate. I was part of the Outlook for three years and you know, worked in Asbury Park, did the entire thing. I was a regular of Amy's Omelet House. Uh, the windmill scarred me for life with the smell of cheese. Hey, uh, I spent my wedding night at the windmill, okay? <laughs> I don't know how to respond to that respectfully, so I'm just. I know. There. It was the uh, only place open, Dan. Okay, so well, no, I, I understand. Choices. Like, so when I was at my my senior year, I lived right on the street, on the other end of the hospital, from there. So the smell of the cheese would permeate through the night through my window and left me scarred in a, in a very deep way. Uh, so getting more into my professional, when I left Lamath, I graduated with a degree in journalism and really hopped around industry to industry. About 12, about 11 years ago, I wound up moving out to San Diego, which I thought was gonna be temporary. Uh, and I wound up meeting my wife very quickly and you know, wife, kids, you don't really have an option. You do what they say. So I am here now and I spent then uh, the five years leading up to the pandemic, I was a global project manager. I, it was ironic for, as, for a state that's the most densely populated with pharmaceutical companies, I wound up going across the country to get a job in pharma. Uh, so did that. And then right at the end of the pandemic, I, or right, sorry, right at the beginning of the pandemic, I wound up my kids were about to turn one. Uh, I took a new job and quickly lost it uh, because of the pandemic, but also some other issues and really had to identify how I was gonna move from there. So I turned to social media and more specifically LinkedIn to brand myself for, uh, for employers. And what I wound up doing was finding this really big, area where people were not connecting and I was able to fill that gap and through that I discovered my passion which was for uh which was for recruitment and I went from having never worked in recruitment to working at Amazon in eight weeks this was led up to by about a year nine months worth of 16 to 18 hour days 
Currently, I'm recognized as one of the top 25 job search experts in the world. I've been featured in Wall Street Journal, uh, New York Times, Business Insider, MSNBC. This I never thought possible when I left. So now what I do is I try to give back to my community as much as I can. And being here from a place where I never thought I was going to amount to anything, to being able to speak to the businesses in the area that really shaped who I am it is a very big deal for me. So I appreciate you all for being here. Uh, this is going to be an open conversation. I, I don't care if you're eating. I don't care what you're doing. If you have a question related to the current market, what to expect, how to attract more employees, I'm more than happy to answer. We could start off with Christine's questions, but this is gonna be very informal, very relaxed. I've got my coffee in my right hand and my water in my left, so I am good to go. Uh, and I'll turn it back over to you, Christine. Thank you for, for having me here. And uh, Kenneth is somebody I've known for a long time and I appreciate seeing you, my friend. Thank you, thank you. Well, I, I do wanna ask, um, your specialty, I, I've read so much about you, Dan, and I'm seeing that you concentrate on DEI initiatives, neurodiversity and hiring, that kind of thing. So when you were in job search, how did that play a part in getting a job? Did so, it play a part? So here's the thing, and this is where it gets interesting. There's a there's the legal reality and there's the reality reality. Legally, the ADA covers anybody dealing with anxiety, depression, ADHD, and, and other neurological disorders. However, we still live in a society that's very much based off of stigma. So for a long time, even the experts, and, and they still do tell you not to disclose your neurodiversity. But what was happening is, I was really good at interviewing and showing as neurotypical, but then I would get into the job and it would feel like a bait and switch because it took me longer to learn certain, uh, certain things. I didn't have the same style as everybody else. And it wound up causing a certain level of frustration. So when I got through this pandemic, when my kids were born, I, I said, you know what, if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this my way. And I took a leap. I posted a video. I said, you know, my name's Dan. I'm neurodiverse. And if that's going to shutter me off from certain companies, then they're not the companies that are meant for me. Now, not everybody could do this because there's a certain point that you have to look at where your finances are, what your capabilities are. For me, what's, this may sound weird. One of the biggest benefits was that I have twins. And I knew for me to go back into the workforce, I had, I had to hit a certain amount. Otherwise, it was just going to cancel each other. I'd basically be working for childcare. So because of that, I was able to really fixate and say, okay, well, this is okay. Because if they're not the company for me, then it's going to work out. And not every, like I said, not everybody could do it. But when I started being open about it, I started realizing that there were secondary effects. Those effects were, I had less pressure on myself. So I was able to do better at my job by appreciating the, what I used to think of as my difficulties, as my differences, as my disorder. I really looked at it strength and I was able to take that like hyper-focus for an example and realize how this could become a great benefit to companies. And by explaining it, uh, in a way that made sense, but also data backed and financially, it really opened a lot of doors for me. Like, let me put it this way. The entire reason I'm really, really good at what I do is because I see a path, I understand the path, and I follow that path. That never would have been something I was able to accomplish so if I hadn't have accepted So do you think that, um, I mean, from what you're saying, neurodiversity helped you in um, yes. in landing your position. A lot of times we see, I mean, the articles were just written this week about 
how a recruiter or hiring manager says, yay, we're the first company and yay, you know, we accept DEI and blah, blah, blah. But then behind closed doors, they do something completely different. So walking the walk and talking the talk are way two different things. Yeah, I, I, I want to be careful because I don't ever like to say that neurodiversity or any specific condition helped land a job. But I prefer to say, and this is just articulation and semantics, but it makes a big difference when we're talking about these things, is the way that I was able to use my differences is what helped. Because there's going to be some people that are extremely prohibited and feel like it's a block for them, mm -hmm. right? When So one of the things I have is language processing disorder, which means I know what I'm saying up here, but I have time a tough time bringing it out down here. Uh, this is something that may be considered a block, especially in an interview format. So in that case, that person may not feel like it's their neurodiversity that is helping them get the job. But if they say, okay, well, based on the lessons that I've learned in doing things this way, I have a different creative approach that can be a culture add to an organization. Then in that construct, the way that they're saying it makes a lot of sense in how they have, how it has helped them achieve their position. So would you say that if we, as a society are looking to become more diverse, inclusive, equity, the whole nine yards. Um, do you think that that is something that a lot of smaller businesses are striving for? Or do you think that's not even, it's on the back burner. I just want to get through the day so I can open my doors tomorrow. I actually think that's, so let me preface this by saying I'm a disruptor in the industry. I don't like the way the recruitment is done today. I think it's, I think it's horrible. But with is that there said, specific that's horrible. If we want to open up Pandora's box, we absolutely can. But <laughs> I I'm know <laughs> opening up Pandora's box. Yes. So let me say this: uh, large companies are going to have a lot harder time adjusting to the trends that we are seeing within fixing the job market and the recruitment process than smaller businesses. Smaller businesses, by virtue of being smaller they're not as far away from the ground floor. So if things need to be adjusted, if things need to be altered, there's somewhat of an easier time. Now, I wanna be very clear in saying this doesn't mean that anything is visibly different from a storefront perspective, from a customer perspective, because that is a situation that would say that would create pause. But what I am saying is the infrastructural elements that we utilize and understand in order to build our business, those are things we can go in. Uh, and I'm not even gonna say fix because not everybody is prone to, to doing things differently, uh, but these are things that can be adjusted more on the smaller scale than the larger scale. That's interesting that you say that because I think that um, smaller businesses that I'm speaking with are waiting to see what the big guys do, what the big businesses do, and That's take the their cues from that. So they're kind of standing still and not doing anything, waiting for those big, you know, not to pin with Google or Facebook or whatever, like the really big companies to implement something and then for it to trickle down. And you're but saying- That's how we've gone to this point. Yeah. We've lived in a wait and see society for a yeah. long time. The reason I came out and spoke about my ADHD was because I understood that in order for change to be made, other people had people had to stand out and take that risk. You can't wait on a large company to initiate change because the reality is that there are so many more red flags and roadblocks that are going to occur in these larger companies that aren't necessarily the case within the smaller. Let me give you an example. So I'm really big on women's empowerment and, and narrowing the gender and racial wealth gap. So one of the things from a humanitarian perspective that we look at is the uneven distribution of emotional labor on women in the workforce. So a large company is gonna have to create an SOP. They're gonna have to create amendments. They're gonna have to bring somebody in to explain how this could be reorganized. In a smaller business, 
a business owner can take a look and do, I, I know businesses hate the term auditing, but hold on for a second, but they can audit what they're doing and see if implementation could be made. Am I putting the, the brunt of emotional labor on the women to handle? Or if somebody's having a bad day as a male, am I asking them, how are you doing? Am I showing compassion? The other things that could be looked at is, do we understand the differences between aggressiveness and assertiveness? Are we, if we look at the pay, at the pay scale, right now, uh, white women get 82% per dollar, black women 58 to 68 cents per dollar. How are we looking at the wages and how can we really adjust this to make it more equitable? Now, some people are doing this through the use of commission-based. There's all different ways. I'm not here to tell you how to do that, but you could see how these types of things are more implementable. I don't even know if that's a word, which is bad for, an, for a former editor, uh, on a small scale than they would be on a large scale. Um, and quite frankly, the politics in larger companies are pretty, are pretty atrocious. Uh, and I'm not signaling anybody out, but even if we look at a company like Salesforce, Salesforce, two years ago, they had very few persons of color, Black individuals in management positions. They had a huge initiative to shift that over. About three or four months ago, they posted a video celebrating how well that they had done and how many more people. The post went viral on LinkedIn, but what you started to see was hate message after hate message after hate message predicated on this. So that, this is my ADHD, I'm trying to remember where I was going with that, but you get it, so I'll stop there. I am also seeing in, uh, at least in Monmouth County area, we have uh, different sized businesses. And even though there is a government initiative to implement DEI and to hire disabled population or re-entry population or whatever special interest group happens to be out there, um, they're not equitable jobs. There are lower paying mm -hmm. entry level jobs so that they can check off the box and say, I hired disabled, but yet they're getting that minimum wage and they're not thought of as equal uh, management, so to speak. And, and that's not happening at every company, but it's happening in a lot. How do you uh, address something like that and give them the chance to show what they have? So interesting question. I'm going to use an example from out here in San Diego. Uh, my wife works within this area in terms of negotiating salaries. And what they found was in the city of San Diego, the majority of the low in, uh, of the low paying jobs were being held by Hispanic women primarily. And the reason for this is, is that they had the least amount of requirements from an educational perspective. So these women were entering because that was all that they could get, but within any city structure, they were capped at a certain level. So even if they reached the top level, then they were still under the poverty threshold. Yes. So when time came to negotiate, the problem was that there, the people at the top still wanted their raise and they weren't willing to adjust to get the people in the lower scale to just uh, to even get them above the poverty threshold. And the reality is, is this, and there's no good answer. Like you just asked me a question. It's almost impossible to answer. And I respect that you did it, but the reason it's almost impossible to answer is because, and I'm just going to speak openly and bluntly in certain situations, there are additional modifications that need to be met. And when we see that we are going to have to do extra work for somebody, I think the initial reaction through bias, regardless of whether it's intentional or not, is that because there's extra work, they shouldn't get paid as much. Now, what I'm saying is just what I'm seeing, please don't take it as even me saying it should be the case. 
a lot of times we don't look at it like, okay, well, what can this person offer? What can this person provide that will help them not only be employed and really serve within the community, but how can this person thrive and help the business grow? They're looked at as almost a handout. And I know how horrible that is to say. Absolutely. As opposed to an active and contributing member of the company. And we have to create that more personalized approach and understand that neurodiversity and disability doesn't mean uncapable. It doesn't mean that they can't contribute in a significant way. Part of what I think needs to be done, which is really difficult, but you can't force it, is more education on on business owners, uh, companies. Quite honestly, I think that there's a lot of organizations that help people, whether it's with Down syndrome or Asperger's or whatever, Mm -hmm. find work, but they're grossly underfunded and they may know how much this person can absolutely benefit a business, but they can't force the people that they're getting them jobs with to acknowledge that. So there's a fine line here. Um, I just think it's something we need to, to be better of as a society. Um, I, I agree. And that's, uh, that's very similar to what I am seeing. Kathy wrote in the chat, large hospitals scream for personnel. Small companies set up interviews and see candidates immediately. Decisions are made and based on an interview as opposed to behavioral questionnaire. So the, her solution, let HR staff interview someone sooner rather than later so they can make those assumptions or you know um, thought processes. I'm wondering is that a solution or is it also to educate we already know as HR people, um, I'm certified in HR. I can see, I'm, you know, can do all of that stuff. But what about recruiters? Internal, external, agency. What about hiring managers? Giving them the same information that an HR person would know so they can make that choice. So, Kathy, first of all, I appreciate your feedback and these the behavioral questionnaires you're talking about. Um, look, I'm a very blunt person. I'm speaking to a bunch of New Jerseyans. It's stupid. <laughs> like just bluntly, they're stupid. They, they serve no freaking purpose. Um, but he, here's the only pushback that I could provide. Working in big tech, I can tell you for a fact that the behavioral questions, tip, questionnaires typically exist post screening with an interview with a recruiter. However, I don't like most recruiters. <laughs> I think they do a horrible job. Uh, and part of that is the business that they're in. So let's just quickly provide the dynamic. Staffing agencies are a numbers game. They're gonna provide five to 10 minute interviews. They're really, really fast paced. And the requirements are pretty obscene. So even if a recruiter wants to provide more time on these interviews, they don't necessarily have the ability. Agencies are a lot more dedicated to working on behalf of the candidate, uh, but there's still a disconnect. Corporations like Amazon, we have the ability to spend more time, but it's also uh, the hiring process is more separated. So for instance, I just had a friend of mine that started and she's like, well, what's the difference? Because I used to take everything from start to finish. And I said, well, with sourcers, we find the candidates, we bring them in, we prep them and get them ready to go for the interview. But then a different person takes over to close. So these are the differences. In my personal opinion, the thing that the pandemic has brought up, the thing that the great resignation has brought up is that there needs to be more of a focus on getting to know a candidate. 
I hate the idea of culture fit. Hate it. I believe we should constantly be looking for people that have perspectives that we don't currently have. Now, how do you find that out? There's only one way, and that is through having conversations. I don't ask candidates, tell me about yourself, because they get asked that a thousand times per day. It puts them on the spot, and now they're forced to give a version of their lives that doesn't nearly encapsulate who they are. So instead, we go into casual conversation, talk about their strengths, their weaknesses, what they like, what they don't like. I try to learn about their motivations, the family dynamic. Now, this may seem like it doesn't make sense, but when you understand a person's motivations, you understand how they're going to react in an office atmosphere. Somebody that whose why is because they have a family at home to feed may be more inclined to do the hard work than somebody that is 22 single going out every night. I mean, that's a basic example. So I think we need to spend more time getting to know these people. And then what you're going to find, and based on the data I've collected, is as opposed to the average work time at one employer being grossly reduced, which is what we've seen in recent years to about two to three, I still love the idea of being able to stay at a company long-term to build that loyalty out and not just on the employee side, but on the employer side. So I do think we have the ability to get back to that if there's the room to grow and if we take the time to truly understand and make sure that we're asking ourselves as employers, not only is this candidate right for me, but am I right for the candidate? So, go t- you know, just jumping off of Kathy's um, question. Um, thank you, Kathy. <laughs> um, if we're having conversations with applicants, having a conversation as opposed to a scripted behavioral interview and asking certain questions, well, a conversation generally takes longer. Yep. And if we are inundated with a lot of resumes as a recruiter or HR or whatever it happens to be, Um, everyone just throws their resumes to the wind, then how do you know who goes in the A pile, B pile, C pile? Who gets the phone call to ask that conversational question as opposed to answering behavior questions? Another great question. And I'm going to be blunt again and say I hate (laughs) resumes. Uh, They do not tell you jack about the candidate. So here's the difference. Here's where we were five years ago and where we are now. Five years ago, there was a strong dedication to creating the best possible resume to be seen by the employers. And then that in general is how we'd be picked. However, with the in, with the pen, when the pandemic hit, what wound up happening is that there were so many job seekers out there that there needed to be a different way to stand out. A resume was not going to do it, especially if you're looking to hire somebody that's a little bit different. Uh, For example, one of the most underappreciated types of job seekers are teachers. Teachers are project managers to a T. Nobody can tell me that they can't go to almost any job and be successful at it. Point blank, lack of respect. These are things that just based on a resume, you're not going to see. Now, I understand that there's a difference between small business and and corporations. I rely on a couple of things. I strongly rely on LinkedIn. And the reason for that is because if a person is going, if a person has put together their LinkedIn profile cohesively, cleanly, uh, respectfully, it's showing me a lot of the details that they're going to bring over into an office environment. If they have everything neat, if they have everything tight, there's no grammatical errors, I'm seeing an attention to detail. If I look at their about section, I see how they're writing. And not everybody's a great writer, I'm not holding them to that, but it gives them an opportunity to tell me more of a story about who they are. How many connections they have, you know, there's little things like they have, people on LinkedIn have an ability to customize their URL. It's very easy to tell the difference. Is this something that they're doing? And 
while I wish that it was more dynamic than that, being able to review that is a big difference maker. Now, if you're asking me, well, how do I determine the ABC bio uh, based on the resume alone? That's more difficult. And that in that case, I understand why you couldn't necessarily dedicate a certain amount of man hours, man or woman hours, I apologize, uh, to going through and spending and spending that time on, on the call. So it really just depends on how your outlook is and the determining factor. But usually if you're looking at things like LinkedIn, if you're looking at social, you can get a pretty good gauge for who that individual is. I agree with you, Dan, on uh, especially with the use of LinkedIn. Um, I'm wondering for you, for other companies or recruiters that you've talked to, when we're dealing with an entry level person or just above an entry level person, maybe a supervisor, but not yet management, um, does LinkedIn come into play? Do they have to have a LinkedIn if they have that resume? I actually thoughts? believe that people should be on LinkedIn from late high school. And the reason for this is, is we're seeing about 70% of jobs filled based on connections and networking. So, and I, yeah, I knew where you were going with that. You were leading me in. Very good job. I appreciate you. Thank uh, you. <laughs> <laughs> never one short to call somebody out. Uh, so, you know, it's not even about the fact that they're looking for jobs. It's as you show your presence, as you show your capability and your skill, it shows a dedication level that's hard to, it's hard to duplicate. And I'm not talking about kids that have their parents being like, hey, you need to be on this. No, I'm talking about the young men and women that take the initiative themselves to jump on and say, okay, let's see what I could do. Now, adults can be reticent to connect with somebody in high school, completely understood. But starting to build that network, even if it's network within your own community, can be a big advantage. The reality is you never know who you know. Absolutely. I agree. So what do you think is the difference between LinkedIn and Handshake for those that are college students? Can't lie. I have no idea what Handshake is. Ah, Handshake <laughs> is uh, for college students. It's a college LinkedIn. It's a version of college LinkedIn. And um, so then they're learning how to use uh, Handshake when they go off to college, but then they're learning how to use LinkedIn. So if they haven't been taught in high school, then um, it is, yes, yeah, another platform, but um, a college student has been said that LinkedIn is for old people. So <laughs> depends on how you are looking at uh, LinkedIn and the value and uh, what you plan to put into it and get out of it, I guess. Um, and again, it's general, it's not every child and not every college student. But um, that, that's been reported. <laughs> you know, just because I was alive when Blockbuster still existed does not make me old. Uh, so I, I sort of get what they're saying, but as somebody that is considered a LinkedIn expert, even if I don't consider myself it, mm -hmm. I can tell you that what is being worked on behind the scenes of LinkedIn is a lot more friendly to that age group, to that crowd. There's less of a focus on it being completely business oriented and more about people wanting to show who they are. Because if you look at it truly, who somebody is, is ultimately a play within that business aspect. So I want to know if somebody you know enjoys me it, or if somebody's going to take a stance, if somebody says, okay, well, I'm going to, if a 21 year old is going to write about George Floyd and have a really eloquent response and post, that's going to catch my notice. That's going to really bring my attention. 
LinkedIn, I would actually argue, is less for the high level. But here's why because I want to make sure that this is clear. When you reach a certain level of employment, most times recruiters are going to be reaching out to you. So here's kind of me breaking the fifth wall. And this is sad to say, most of the people that I recruit are already in positions. So that is that executive level, which leaves really this large window for those that are the mid-career level. And by the way, there's dynamics with this. There's not just mid-career, there's career changers. So before we were going to school and we we're saying, okay, well, we're not going to be able to change careers. You have so many people that have transitioned to tech, to program management, to product management, uh, to a whole variety of things based on what's happened the last three years that the category of job seeker has expanded quite exp exponentially. I mean, even so much as on that senior level, 50s and 60s are not are no longer considered old in a lot of respects. Look, not saying ageism doesn't still exist, but what I am saying is it's a lot more common now to find people in their late 50s, early 60s still getting jobs uh, without as much fear. And Kenneth may be able to talk to that more in, in detail. Absolutely. Um, I, we've had several guests um, talking about ageism and we were, I mean, we're talking about a lot of different issues that a job seeker has. So from a business standpoint, how do you attract those job seekers that are searching for a job, but maybe never even thought of that business as being a good fit for them um, with the job openings that they have or their corporate culture. We talk about, I mean, it's titled inclusive recruiting to maximize results. How do they get as a business maximum results from recruiting inclusively? So this is, there's two parts to this. One is that, people have to be open to it. So in saying that, what I'm saying is a company can do initiatives to bring in more diverse populations. There's very easy tools, sourcing tools that could be used to do this. But if you're really looking at overall brand awareness, it's a very sensitive topic because let me give you a scenario. You're a company and you say, okay, I want to attract people over 55. You create a marketing ad on this. Now there's two ways to look at this, right? I'm trying to be inclusive of people over 55. The other way of looking at it is, am I going to be a, to is this tokenism? Yes. And that's where the company really has to understand that it's a long-term play as opposed to a short-term because you're not, if you start doing an initiative like that and after three months, you're like, I'm not getting anybody, you're missing the entire point. It takes time to rebuild respect and for an organization that had previously not done it. And what we found is the data backs it up, the more diverse a workforce, the more productive that they are because it's bringing in varying degrees of opinions. And when you have culture fit and you get the same opinion over and over, you're gonna get the same result. So it's having that, that type of inclusive workforce. And you know this goes beyond just who you have in. It's a matter of who's doing the interviewing. If you have a mid-sized company and you're looking to retain talent and you ha you have, you're bringing a woman to interview and they're going to be interviewing with, with three people, probably shouldn't be all three men. You should be able to bring somebody in and, and not only that, but have them meet and do an informational interview if they so choose or offer it to them 
with somebody that's on the actual team so that they could gain a better perspective of what life is really like. If you are not doing it to save face and you're doing it because you truly believe in it, then you have nothing to fear by doing it. Every single one of my candidates that I can, I have do those informational interviews with somebody in the role. And here's the other aspect of it. When, if you have a woman that's coming in and you have two out of three interviewers that are women, the perception is gonna be that this is what's gonna carry over. They're gonna see somebody that's, that looks like them that subconsciously that they feel has their back. And by doing that, you're providing a more positive candidate experience as they come in and are more likely to retain them, but you have to keep it up. There's a recruiter uh, by the name of Monique Arrington. She's been one of my mentors in this and she's a diversity recruiter. She has her own firm. She actually holds companies to KPI metrics to ensure that they're retaining diverse talent and they have to had done this for at least a year or two before she'll even agree to, to help them. And there are a ton of KPI metrics that you could hold a company to. Like KPIs are scary only for people that are worried about not making them. If I you're worried about meeting KPI in, metrics. Um, that you had said it takes a long time to... Yeah make this happen. It's not like three months. Okay. I'm not getting any results. So I give up, um, you know, the, the perfect example is we, for those of us of a certain age, <laughs> you know, back in the day we had the Tylenol scare and that took Tylenol how long before we trusted Tylenol as a brand name again and uh, over and over again and, and putting themselves out there and in our face and that goes for a lot of different brands and, and even if you made a mistake or had some kind of bad marketing what are you doing to correct the situation and change course to be able to move forward all of those things we've witness it as consumers and that's what your job seeker is as a consumer so it's not really a far fetch for a business to use this for recruiting yeah no it's it's not far fetched at all and at the end of the day when we show people that we're willing to do these kinds of things we're showing our humanity and the fact that we care and people adapt and respect that and it makes them happier. And then there's the long-term benefits is they're going to be inclined to, if you have another opening to bring in somebody that they know, and if you, you know, there's nothing better than having a great employee that brings in somebody because that they know that they're going to be another great employee. So how should businesses get started? Um, it, some businesses have already started to develop that inclusive recruiting and hiring more of the specialized populations. If you haven't gotten started or you wanna take another step further, what is the next step for them? What should they do? I think a lot of it comes down to education, to reaching out and finding what those resources are going to be that they're looking at. The first thing we talk to job seekers about and the first thing that we talk to businesses about is clarity. If you clearly are able to identify where your gaps are, then you're going to be able to find solutions to fill those gaps. So if you know that you haven't had success in hiring women, I know I keep going back to this example, then you should reach out to some women's rights organizations and bring them in and see if they're willing to provide uh, tips or, or tricks or how you could work within it to, to be better. If you know that you're missing out on other things, there's so many resources out there. Now, will you have to spend money on some of them? Absolutely. But if you're not willing to commit them, if you're not willing to commit the candidate then or to make the to commit money then how much how willing are you to actually make a difference 
Does anybody have any questions that uh, is listening still or is not multitasking? Just put it in the chat box or take yourself off mute. I'm happy to uh, relay that information to Dan while we have him for a few more minutes. He has another meeting he has to go to, so uh, I would appreciate that. I feel like I've done a lot of talking. <laughs> and Kathy, too, thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, we have one person coming up. Are there any other questions? Very informative. I appreciate all your suggestions, Dan. All right. Very good. Thank you, Dawn. Absolutely. We covered most of it. Dan, are there any parting thoughts that uh, you would like to leave our businesses with as they attempt to make more inclusivity in their departments, in their recruiting practices that they can take away? I think it's worth mentioning that there's so many groups out there that are doing great work. It, you, know, you don't have to be on LinkedIn to be connected to it, but listening to different DEI podcasts, really having a touch with what's going on is immensely helpful in understanding where you need to go. So I'm not gonna, I've, I've spoken a lot, I'm not gonna go too far into it, but here's the thing with me, and I'll tell everybody, because, and Christine and, and Kenneth know this, uh, once I connect with you, there's open dialogue. So if you do have a question uh, at a later point and you wanna send me a message, feel free to, uh, LinkedIn is my preferred method, but I'm more than happy to provide uh, my email address to anybody that needs it. Again, it's very special for me. So uh, it, it makes me incredibly happy to be able to provide back to the specific community. And it makes us incredibly happy for you to share that information with us. Uh, it's not often that we do get an expert SME in uh, DEI and who's been on both sides. So to just be able to be honest, the honest recruiter, to tell it like it is, is a huge thing for all of us. So um, I thank you so much. You're welcome. I am going to hop off to prep for Absolutely. my call, but thank you so much, everyone. I look forward to connecting. Everyone take care and I will send you the link and URL as soon as it is recorded and done. Okay. Thanks, everyone. We'll talk soon. Bye.